Hi everyone, welcome again to Queensland Raceway for round five of the Shannons Nationals. The racing this weekend has been action packed so far and it's set to continue with the penultimate round of the Australian Prototype Series along with round four of the Australian Production Car Series. And that title fight is getting interesting as we get closer to the season climax at Wakefield Park. The prototypes are about to hit the track before we see them. Tony Shebeki managed to catch up with the new series leader after yesterday's first race, Mark Lauke. The prototype series is another series that's been joining us this year on the Shannon's calendar. And Mark Lauke is the championship leader at the moment. Congratulations, Mark. Thank you very much. I've just sneaked in there the results of the last race. Yeah. So three points ahead. This is a really tight championship. Probably one of the tightest championships in Australia at the moment. Well, I'd like to think it is, um, because we're trying to make good, close, competitive racing, and we're trying to ensure that we set up the entire series so that anybody can win. Momentum's a great thing in motor racing, isn't it? You've got it with you at the moment, a fantastic round at Sydney Motorsport Park a few weeks ago, and you bring that here to Queensland Raceway. Yes, well, yeah, momentum, I guess, is actually reliability more than anything else. Uh, it's not quite like uh, the physical sports of football uh, and team. Yes, we are merely drivers uh, and when we drive the car we're holding it in trust for the rest of the people to do all the hard work but I've got to say that uh, really momentum here is more than anything uh, development of the car and the reliability of the car. I, I was told once if to finish first, first you have to finish and that's always been my problem is finishing. So prototypes out on track now for their first race of the day and I guess the headline news immediately is the fact that uh, the car off the second spot on the grid, Jason Macris hasn't fronted issues in the pit, pit, in the pit and paddock area, not being able to get the uh, engine fired. Uh, Gary O'Brien's jumped right alongside me, so headline not so good for Macris, is it? No, uh, the uh, 1.4 litre Kawasaki refused to uh, kick over. And unfortunately, our round two dominator, well, not dominator, he just won all three races, is uh, not able to start in this event. Uh, we had a standing start yesterday. We've got rolling starts today. So uh, it really throws a spanner into the works as far as uh, getting your techniques correct when they're all different in the way they start the car. So we've got David Barham on his own on the front row in the, in the Chiron. So Barham lead, will lead, Macris not getting to the grid. Lauke to Sutton. Then it is uh, Drake Pettit, Terry Peavert is Petty Hill, Richard Mattia and David Arogi as we come to the line. We're just about to get underway. Barham will get away nicely and then Chris Sutton goes with him. Up the inside goes John Paul Drake as Lackey is left napping. Loses two spots on the run down into turn one and John Paul Drake squeezes through there like a pimple out of your forehead and just goes bearing down into turn two. Yeah, and Sutton is the one who got the advantage, went to second. Uh, Pervitas is uh, also uh, dropped a, a couple spots. He had dramas yesterday. They had a vibration in the car, pitted early, and then had a drive through from speeding out of pit lane, but still managed to get back to seventh spot. Wow, Chris Sutton in the 35 Radical there, holding two Wests, charging there with John Paul Drake. It's a fantastic return to form early in this race, and Lackey's going to go with them now, so just caught napping a little bit off the start there. Looks down the inside and takes two with one foul swoop and into almost, the uh, turn four. And almost ran wide, but it was interesting. You can see the profile difference between the Wests and the Radical. The, the Radical stands a lot taller in the air than what the uh, West do. And so on these longer straights, it really suits the West. And Lauke again, uh, really going heavy on the braking area to try and uh, get ahead of these two. It's got to be a good round for him. He won all three races at Sydney Motorsport Park. His major adversary is now out of contention, not only in in Jason Macris, but in Phil Hughes, who didn't uh, make the start today, had to borrow a car yesterday. That failed midway through the race. And unfortunately, uh, he will score no further points, but he can drop his worst two races for the year. Yeah, unfortunately, Phil Hughes is not going to take any further part as we see Terry P. P. Vitas in the FL1 streaming through there as well. And that's going through on uh, Whiting and Hill, I think, in the uh, 117 uh, is Brett Pettit. Yeah, Brian Pettit, he's just got past in that uh, Clubman style of car. That's an older uh, ADR, uh, I should say, not the Clubman. There are Clubmans in this race. Got a replay here of this great move by Mark Lackey. Down the inside of turn four, not get one, but get 
both and move from fourth to second. Great vision and commitment there to Mark Lauke. He'd be able to pull that off. He did run slightly wide, but didn't lose a whole lot of lap time out of that run. And John Paul Drake here as well. Here's a couple of the local Queenslander boys who have joined the series for this round. Car number two, which is Peter Hill. And, of course, uh, car number 23. One of the older style cars, the Clubmans, which became Sports 1300. Now they've put a wing on the back of them and they uh, they look the goods, don't they, with the driver sitting that's right That's now an 1800. The, yeah, and it's uh, sitting right at the back of the, uh, of the car and the engine forward of the driver where... In the other cars, the engine is behind the driver. Yeah, right between the shoulder blades, basically, in the case of the uh, the Wests and the FLs. Uh, another one we should talk about, Michael Whiting in the older model West. That car had to have the uh, new front splitter put on it, so they took it off the car Phil Hughes took over, and they put that on the front of it so it could get out and race his So it's one. a bit of a Frankenstein, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. a bit of a, well, bit fortunately, of there was, there's two of the older model West yeah. running, so and one's out, so why not use the front end off the other? And unfortunately, he spun yesterday in turn five, driver error, and uh, it's what really allowed Macris to get past Lauke for second yesterday. Mark Lauke now is being absolutely menaced by, uh, well, his teammate in Jam Motorsport there, John Paul Drake, and uh, he has got the mirrors absolutely full of that multicoloured extravaganza as we have a look uh, just a tad back down the uh, the field here. This is number 117, which is Pettit, and the 33 of Whiting, the uh, the one that we've just been talking about, a bit of a, a Frankenstein car. It's got the orange clip off the front of Cookie's car that uh, Phil Hughes commandeered yesterday. And a uh, real shame that, that uh, Phil hasn't taken to the grid here today. He's had a bit of a torrid old weekend. His, uh, his radical didn't make it through Friday after uh, doing some engine damage. The car that he uh, expired on him as well. I guess, I guess all to the advantage of uh, Michael Whiting because he's now got a, a front on his car. Back yeah. to uh, the lead here. In fact, not quite the lead. David Barham is now 10.8 seconds out in front of uh, of the field at the moment in number 46 which is his sharon lmp3 two liter car so he's got the best part of half a liter advantage uh, over anyone else in the field in the sharon but this is the battle and, and if you like this is actually the the ones that are left in the title hunt outright particularly mark lauke trying to drag maximum points from this weekend so that he can uh, uh, claw back the advantage that phil hughes has so we've got Chris Sutton now behind Terry Piavita. So there's been a move. Now, Chris Sutton was second early. He's now dropped down to fifth position. And uh, Piavita is still locking up that uh, inside right front tyre going into uh, turn three on that occasion. He was doing it down at turn six fairly regularly. I can't see that whether that yellow must have been just a local yellow that was out. And it may have been for Chris Sutton. We... He may have had a little bit of an excursion off the road, and that's why Terry Piavetis is in front of him. Of course, Piavetis is in the um, RFR, the Ralph Furman Racing uh, Formula 1000, or FK, or F1K, as it's uh, more commonly known these days. As we watch these uh, two route west, the WX10s still fighting it out, and uh, oh, off the road, big time. And that's a huge off, but fortunately, lots of run off there. Get he gets it, it back on. <laughs> John Paul Drake. That uh, wouldn't have been fun for the initial uh, spear off there. He's uh, having trouble trying to get it back on the track. As well. He may have got some damage, has yeah, he? Yeah, he may, may have. It bounced across the circuit. That uh, sus that extra shock absorber wouldn't have done him much no. good in that situation, no, well, well, you, When you bottom it out, that's for sure. You're uh, skating across the, uh, the dirt there. I like the sticker on the underside of that wing there. And uh, we go and have a look at what happened there. John Paul Drake. Oh, it unloaded mid-corner. That was... Uh, something went wrong there. He had uh, no further turn in. He turned in, and then he just unloaded. I think it might have been the sheer pace of the car might have done that. We were watching these guys down there at, on Friday. Every time we go through turn two, both uh, Lauke and John Paul Drake and even Jason Macris, you could see they were getting on the power slightly earlier every time in a bid to try and see how much they can drive out of the corner as early as they can. And a couple of them didn't quite get it right also. 
sudden they're going a bit twitchy and all over the place and they realize, okay, we've got to the point where we can't accelerate any sooner. We've just got to manage that now. While we've been watching that, we've just seen this uh, a great dice going on there between... Uh, this is for position too. Uh, yeah, there was uh, the Pettit Whiting dice and now we've gone back and we've got Lauke and Piavitas fighting over second. So Terry's come from the clouds. So Mark Lauke's lost eight seconds on that last lap yeah. there. So not sure what went on there. And uh, the Orlando Phoenix FL1 has uh, got right onto the back of Mark Lauke. And now Mark Lauke's an unassuming kind of race driver. He's... Uh, come late to the sport and uh, he's a happy race driver. He is a very happy race driver. In fact, if you're uh, not feeling a little bit down, go and stand next to Mark Lauke and <laughs> no you'll get some energy, energy rub, off, rub off on him. He really is a, a positive kind of guy. Runs the Lauke flour mills, which uh, we've had a pizza uh, in the last week or so. It's probably come from uh, something that he's grown and uh, processed. Another change of position between Pettit and Whiting. Whiting goes ahead. The gap. Oh, oh. Lauke goes off wide. Oh. Almost ends up in Snake Gully. Gathers it all back up. Piavitas couldn't quite take advantage of that uh, drop off in pace. It probably caught Piavitas out of just as much because I think Piavitas got... was following him there. Yeah. Was, uh... Well, I think uh, Lauke fortunately just got back on the right point on the road that uh, Piavitas had no other work place Piavides to go. Piavitas getting a little bit of oversteer coming out of the straight there as uh, well. I so think he's fired up now. He's key. Last lap coming up and he knows that uh, Lauke is struggling a bit in front of him, but can he get close enough to actually put some more pressure on him? Down through turn two now, last time around, and onto the back straight. Not a lot between these two cars down the back straight. If anything, the uh, front car of the two has a little bit better airflow. Less frontal area, though, on the 1000. That's the other thing of getting it actually through the air. The other thing is that uh, you see the, the west has a very, very low slung wide rear wing, whereas the uh, the 1000 has the twin plane rear wing. Our race leader coming around onto the straight. And this is another fantastic victory to David Barham. And he's going to do it by about 21.9 seconds. And across the line he goes to take victory in race two for the weekend of the Australian Prototype Series. So David Barham taking a sweet victory there. Down the final corner, Lauke very slow through four and five on the last occasion, but he held the line and there was nothing Piavitas could do about it. Having another run, adding down the straight, just not close enough, about a car length behind. Quick look at the results. David Barham takes the checkered flag, 21.6 seconds ahead of Mark Lauke. Terry Piavitas, a very close third. Chris Hutt gets back to fourth ahead of Michael Whiting and Brian Pettit, who took their fight all the way to the flag. David Rochi was in seven. Richard Mattia, a John Paul Drake, a non-finisher, as was uh, Peter Hill. Uh, it's going very well. Uh, I've got um, Errol Gilmore from Gilmore Racing helping me this weekend, and he's really helping me um, refine the car and, and my style, and uh, yeah, I'm setting PBs all the time. So yeah, a uh, race of attrition this weekend for the prototypes, and really looking forward to the next round. Here's how it started. We started with a good field of cars. We did, and Rochi was the one that made the premature move, and he would get penalised for it. And as you can see, Barham already set up a fairly good gap over his rivals. And there we see Chris Sutton in third spot, being chased by Terry Piavitas in the open wheeler style prototype. And here we see Piavitas battling with Sutton for position three. Not much between them as they go down through turn one. And here they still continue down to turn three. And this time, Terry Piavitas on the brakes late, late, locks up the right front wheel, but gets the job done, takes over that position. And that put Terry Piavitas up into position three in the race. And within no time, he was on the back of the second place, Lauke, who we think may have had a bit of a drama somewhere out of our vision. And here, Terry looks for a way around the points leader just after this lock up from Piavides and a little puff of smoke as it comes out of turn three. The no further drive. Ralph Berman Racing Formula 1000 came to a halt on the run to turn four. That did necessitate I a I guess the hands car. up in the air with <laughs> frustration there for Terry was on for a good points haul Indeed, in that race. We this was under safety car. As we went back to a restart, and uh, from the restart mark, Lauke had the advantage over Chris Sutton. Those two uh, pulling out a fair gap. They came down the line, and taking the chequered flag was Mark Lauke, head of Chris Sutton. 
I've got to say that Jason's always, if I'm in front, he's always all over me. Mostly he's in front of me and I'm just doing my best to catch him. Uh, so, yeah, I was m very disappointed actually when he didn't front up on the grid. And because I'd set my whole psyche to do this race with Jason. Um, and when he wasn't there, I was lost for a little while. Uh, but hey, I know, I'm resilient, I recovered. The Australian Prototype Series will conclude its enthralling season at the next round of the Nationals at Phillip Island in September. But after the break, it's race two of the Australian Production Car Series. After four wins in a row at Sydney Motorsport Park, that is what a winner does. He does the shoey, and that winner's with us right now, Bob Pearson, and you remain the winner, mate. Congratulations on the uh, fight in the night victory with uh, Rick Bates. Yeah, that was great, but I'm not doing any more shoeys, thanks. <laughs> no. That was my first and last. Thank you very much. Yes, lucky it wasn't the uh, full-on champagne, though, so it was, uh, it was OK. Mate, uh, gee whiz, we talk about things just going your way, momentum and stuff. It, it's really happening for you at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it gets down to pretty good planning and, and teamwork and uh, racing's the whole package. It's not just about going fast all the time and uh, you know, a lot of planning's got to go into it and you've got to, you know, second guess correctly and and um, yeah, that's part of the experience, I guess. Um, and we're, we're happy with the results at the moment, but things are going good. Here we are for the start of the second leg of round four of the Australian Production Car Series here at Queensland Raceway. Cars gridding up for 300 kilometres of uh, flat out action here this afternoon. We're only moments away from getting this race started. 300 kilometres again on the uh, menu for these teams. We've got the grid right here in front of you now. It's Bob Pearson on pole electing to start the race. Ian Sheeran alongside. Then we've got Nathan Morgan, Berwick Linton, Carl Begg, Lachlan Givens in the Subaru. Colin Osborne will start at, in the number 13 car. Stephen Champion next one. Tony Hatton and Michael Gray. Some going with the same order as yesterday, some reversing their order. Revs rise. Will the four wheel drive car of Bob Pearson jump away from the line as it has done for the last two race weekends that Bob's been at the wheel? The Merc jumps away nicely as we see the Morecambe car lose the spot off the line. And have a look at Bob Pearson, the wily veteran. Can he be slowed? No is the answer. Don't waste too much time thinking about it. But let's see if the M4 unleashes the beast as Beric Linton logs in behind because Morecambe's now gone back a further spot. So we'll see if the uh, all poor Focus can challenge the C63 Merc. No, but the BMW M4 certainly challenges the Evo 10 and gets by on the run up to Turn 3 for the first time. Into Turn 3, Bob Pearson not giving up there. Certainly going to try and stay with the M4 as much as he can. There's a 1M behind him. He's in a BMW sandwich. He's in fact, he's in a European exotic car sandwich. The Merc ranges up. Big alongside Beric Linton, looks to the inside. That V8 E63 looks a little bit out of place there. The more of a luxury saloon than the uh, the sporty interactions around it. But doing a really good job. 6.3 litres of V8 under the bonnet of that Mercedes. As Linton goes down the inside of Pearson at turn six, takes away second position. But the jet, it's a jet that's out in front and just steamrolling on the first lap. It certainly is. Getting away very, very smartly indeed. As uh, as Bob Pearson loses his spot to Beric Linton coming around turn six that time as well. So Bob Pearson absolutely bounded away from the start line. He's now getting gazumped by the uh, the Euro cars around him, but he's putting up a big fight in the number 33, the red product car, as opposed to uh, the blue and the yellow ones that they've had previously. Yeah, ran the blue car here last year, the red one here this year, and you can tell the difference, it's the pro, it's written in a different colour. And in the meantime, the Mercedes holds on to third position as uh, Pearson looks to go under in the focus, right in behind them. Uh, car 48 in the pits already, the Gore Bensley car. Unfortunately, dramas continue for that one, and the number 40 car started rear of grid because they chose to uh, mark up some more tyres. So that's the Turner Hazelwood car? That's correct. 
But in the meantime, it's our race leader, Sharon, out in front, followed by uh, Linton in second, Beck in third spot, Pearson and Morecambe, the next two. There's a good fight going on between those three for third. Then, of course, we've got uh, Gibbons in the Subaru, followed by car 35, which uh, is Jerry Murphy, uh, who will hand over to um, Jim Policina later. There, the next car in the line. And uh, we're looking here, Pearson trying to retrieve second spot. It's an A1 car versus an A2 car. The difference, of course, is forced induction versus naturally aspirated, but oh, uh, extreme Carl performance. Beck getting sideways power slide through turn one. You don't want to do that to the tyres on the back of this Merc too many times, Carl. I'm not going to tell you how to do your job, but gee, ease up a bit. <laughs> you got 90, uh, still got uh, 94 laps or thereabouts to do. Yeah, as uh, you can see that Morecambe loses just a little bit in a straight line to the Evo, but it seems to be a little bit stronger under brakes. He reiterated this morning that uh, their strong suit was their braking and quartering as the number 48 BMW rejoins after a quick visit to the garage. Uh, Scott Gore at the wheel of that car as we speak. So they've just completed their first lap, even if they had to go via the pits to do it. So just watching where the Class D cars are. James has gone through. Michael Gray has gone back to 20th. So that was always going to happen because the, uh, the car finished strong at the end of last night. It was never going to be uh, a 10th place runner early on. Well, actually, it's uh, second in class because uh, yeah, James has gone through. James, James is leading it in the Toyota 86. They're intermingled at the moment with... Uh, the Kearns Green Falcon AU out of Class I, and uh, we can just see Scott Turner going under the leading Class D car at Turn 6 as we speak. But still, a great battle going on ahead of them with uh, a, good, a good run through the field so far for the other Mercedes in the field, the A45 AMG, which has made its way eighth. eighth, and that's of course got Rod Salmon at the wheel and we'll have young Will Brown taking over that car later in the race. So he started out of 16th, he's already made half the field up there, so Rod Salmon is definitely on a charge. The other one of interest, Gaz, was last night, was the other one of the AU Falcons, the car and Cowan uh, X saloon car as well, that uh, came uh, to a halt after giving the wall a nudge on pit straight. Yeah, and um, had a brush with uh, the Cliff Commodore in the process. So yeah. had, uh, put both of those cars out of the race, one back today, of course, the Falcon. Uh, wasn't repaired or wasn't been able to be repaired in time for this event. So, so Daniel Clift already up to position number 10 in the uh, Class A2 car. And he is uh, uh, currently second in class, to, uh, third in class to Beg and Murphy. Morecambe goes through on Beg to take away position four. And the Mercedes comes back down the outside, but he's on the wrong side of the track, switches over and tries to get in the inside. It'll be interesting to see the pace difference between these two down the back straight. Oh, no, it won't, because he just slid wide out of turn one and um, loses a couple of seconds out of that one. That was a big slide. You thought the one earlier was a good slide. <laughs> this one was a lot better. And yeah, Morecambe had put the big squeeze on the Merc as they came down the straight that time. Replay coming up here of uh, two of Germany's finest with uh, Salmon going down the inside of the Murphy BMW at turn three, takes that position away. Uh, uh, William slows. Now this was happening last night for this car in the early part of the race. He's actually stopped at this time. So what's happening is he's had to, uh, because it goes into a, a limp mode, the only way to fix it is actually switch the engine off and back on again. And it gets underway. And this happened for quite a few laps last night in the early part, but it did come good. You know, we've got one off the road, that's the BM, that's the X Osborne Motorsport Mazda 3 MPS, and that's at turn two, that's gone in a fair way, so I suspect we'll get a safety car out of this. Yep, definitely gone safety car straight away. That's uh, not a good spot to go in. I wonder that's if that's actually a, collected the wall on its way through. Yeah, there. that's the Lee Mitch Taylor, Naylor yep. uh, Mazda. Safety car on track, got uh, replay for the number 42 and how it uh, went off. I think losing a wheel. Well, it's, uh, it's gone off and bashed itself around the air. Looks like it's lost a wheel, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a bit hard to did tell. Did it lose from a wheel shot? because it went off track or did it lose a wheel prior to that? Um, option B, I would imagine. Yeah. 
because it uh, did ride up fairly high and bounced quite a bit. As Morecambe comes to the pits. That's um, unexpected. It is. And are they going to garage that car? No, just pulling into the lane for fuel. Fuel. Okay, so do their top up now of fuel. They won't have a problem with Join fuel Join on the back of the end. train and come through the grid again. Yep. Wise move, so that the next stop they just have to do... Oh, they're going to do a... Two tyres as well. Two tyre pressures. Andrew Rawls in uh, pit lane. Yes, I'm with uh, co-driver Lee. Uh, it's not looking good out there, mate. So what happened? Um, he's, he's lost his left front wheel between one and two and obviously got to two and just gone straight ahead. Um, we're not sure what's happened yet. He was complaining about a vibration from the start. So we sort of asked him to just sort of stay out a bit, suss out what's wrong, see if it's bad enough to pit. Um, but it looks like we should have made the call to pit earlier. Back track side now, safety car has gone in. So we say thank you very much to Michael Parker at the helm of the 570S. And we've got a race back underway. This is Bob Pearson currently sitting third on the road, but being challenged by a car that uh, is right back down the order. In fact, he's only done 12 of the 14 laps. That's Scott Gore at the wheel of that BMW there. But the Mercedes-Benz has certainly got the battle to run. In fact, both those Mercs there, the C63 and the A45, the BMW in there in that battle behind that one. The, uh, that one there on screen is down a couple of laps. So just a bit of an interloper in that battle. And that battle that we've seen at uh, Eastern Creek between the Holden Commodore and the BMW has resumed itself again as we see uh, Murphy go past that lapped Gore BMW. And uh, the beneficiary out of all this has been Rod Salmon, there's been no doubt. He's right back up in the top of the pecking order where he would have been yesterday and would have been this morning, apart from having some dramas mechanically last night that dropped them well out of contention. But certainly for a lot of it, they were there. Race leader, car number 18, black flag. That would probably be for weaving after the safety car had gone. Black flag. So, this is a game changer. This is why Barry Linton and Bob Pearson and Carl Begg and Rod Salmon want to try and stay in touch with that car so that if something like this transpires, they are in a position for a kill. So this is going to put the leader of this race and last night's second place getter in a pretty terrible position. They have got time to fight back and I would suggest plenty of time to, to do fight. so and yep. to push their way back through the field. But the problem with that is that you are pushing back through the field. Andrew Rawls in uh, pit lane. Mitchell, uh, not the way you want to end a long race. Uh, what happened out there? Not the way I want to start a long race. Uh, as soon as I went out, I felt there was a wobble in the front left. I was thinking maybe someone didn't tighten the wheel nuts up. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, I was getting worse and worse and then eventually just let go. Um, what actually happened is the rim, the centre of the rim just snapped clean out. The bolt's still in the hub, so... I mean, how, how do you know that's going to happen? So not much you could do? No, nah, not much we can do. I mean, we can get it out there again if we want to, but we've got to assess the damage underneath the car now. It's been scraped on the ground, so... Ian Sharon has undertaken his drive-through penalty and at the moment is running in position number four. We're on the, the lap 27 of our 96 lap journey and at the moment it's Beric Leighton out in front by just a minimal amount, 1.3... 1.8 seconds ahead of uh, Pearson with seven and a half seconds back to uh, Salmon in third. Gibbons now down the inside of the big car. So um, what's happened there? Because uh, we're seeing Gibbons ahead of Beg, but uh, that's changed. That must have been almost instantaneous that that changed on the timing. So uh, that's put the Mercedes back to ninth position so I dare say tyres has been their problem today in the heat in the warmer conditions and they've been to the lane as well so that's the other thing that's uh, happened with uh, the A2 car as no, no, Troy Williams continues slowly no the Gibbons car has been to the lane and here we should soon have a change for second position um, incidentally Nathan Morecambe back up the fifth spot it's been a good run for them Early strategy call to put fuel in that car under the safety car, pushing back to 19th for a brief spell. We see the uh, Troy Williams 
VE Commodore number 76 come in, driver change. And uh, we will have uh, Jeff Nielsen getting on board there. And uh, we'll take charge of the big VE Commodore. Here we go again, up the back straight, the M4. We would expect to go streaming on by in a straight line. It does, Bob Pearson. Strong under brakes, but the straight line speed of the number 18 BMW dominates there. Bob gave them, again, gentlemanly room to go racing with. And now Ian Sharon will set his sights on getting back to the lead. Berwick Minton, only just 2.8 seconds up the road. Replay for you here, going down to turn three, as in the pits comes the Mercedes C63. Coming in at a ninth position in the race, was running up as high as third early on. So an important pit stop for the uh, landscape of this race. Another good dice going on between the two of the newer cars in Australian production car racing. That's the, the Ford Focus RS now chasing down the A45 AMG. Cars did battle at the Baffer Six Hour this year and doing battle here once again. Out onto the back straight they go, and uh, good comparison of the speed difference between the two. It doesn't seem to be a lot, does it? Just towards the end of the straight, the Mercedes just inches away, just ever so slightly, but the forward focus comes back to it under brakes. Andrew rolls in uh, pit lane. I'm with Troy Williams from the 76 Holden, and uh, Troy, uh, first in for a driver change. Uh, what's the uh, strategy behind that? Uh, we sort of kept the strategy pretty flexible for today. Um, so I was either going to long stint uh, and then have Jeff drive about 40 minutes, 45 minutes towards the end. Um, but we kept it flexible. It's a little bit hot out there, as you can probably tell. Um, and we still haven't got rid of this intermittent electrical problem we had last night. So I thought I'd take the opportunity, give Jeff a steer in the mid stint, see how we go. Dave Morecambe will move up into third position in that uh, DPO. Ford Focus RS. Rod Tamman now fourth, and it'll be a battle of the supercar drivers later on, I guess, with uh, Chas Mostert taking over the Ford Focus and Will Brown jumping into the AMG. And now we get uh, Sharon come through as overlapping the uh, AU Falcon. He took the advantage and uh, now has the race lead. It took a while. And as you can see, the 1M's for sale, so I think uh, Barry Clinton will be looking at something new to take on that front-running car. Uh, some whisper about some sort of Jaguar, maybe, he may be looking at. That was what the word was at the Baffer 6 hour, but at the moment it's Ian Sheeran back in front after a drive-through penalty for what we think was weaving be after the safety car lights had gone out. The big Mercedes heads back out onto track, albeit in 21st place after an elongated seven minute pit stop. Replay coming up of this pass. You can see that he was committed to do it even <coughs> though they had the uh, Kearns Green Falcon on their outside and stuck the nose down in front of Linton through turn three and has taken over the lead. Nice run there, Beric Linton held them off as much as they can. Chaz Mostert uh, has made his way down into pit lane now, bearing himself uh, for his run. We'll be back after this quick break here at the Shannon's Nationals. Welcome back trackside here at the round five of the Shannon's Nationals. And here, unfortunately, we have the number 40 car back in the pit lane again. So dramas continue for that car. We've seen that it had some dramas on that out lap. Yeah, that's a real shame there. We've got the crew again down there with the handheld analyzing kit, which is a simple plug in under the dash. Pick the model of car you want to uh, get the fault code out of and we'll fill your screen with fault codes. Do that with your road car. That's your local mechanics. I was just watching uh, uh, Sam and, and Cliff down the back straight. There's not a lot of straight line performance difference between those two cars. The turbocharged car in front and uh, the V8 running behind it. So that's Salmon putting a lap down on the Cliff car, which is running uh, second in A2, but ninth outright. So they're starting to come 
pretty close to uh, lapping the field, those top five or six cars, aren't they? So just watching the product car that came in out of uh, second place in the race now, and it's uh, third place, sorry, as uh, the car has swapped drivers. Rick Bates at the wheel now as uh, the there you go now heads back out. So it gets a left-hand front tyre. That'll play into the strategy as the race continues on. We are essentially at exactly 50% race distance now. So that is 50% uh, to Bob Pearson and Rick Bates will get uh, to grind the Evo into dust over the next 49 laps as well. With Sharon's lead at the moment, eight seconds over the BMW in second position. As we said, Nathan Borkham in third spot now, elevated due to uh, the changeover there between Pearson and Rick Bates. We see the Cliff, Daniel Cliff bring the uh, class A2 second position at the moment, comes in and Wayne Cliff will jump into this car to do the remainder of the race. Had a great run last night until um, an unfortunate incident involving this car and the Brad car, Colby Cowan Falcon out of turn six. Salmon's in as well. So they're all around about where they hope to be. Uh, uh, if they have another safety car, they'll go very close on fuel. I would, if they don't have a safety car, it'll go very close on fuel because we've actually just got to half race distance. Uh, we know that a couple of them did do a, a, a splash earlier, namely the Ford Focus, so it can go a few more laps. It won't have any dramas fuel-wise in the second half of this race, but some of these other cars who are pitted shy of half distance may have a drama with fuel running towards the end of the race. And um, Rick Bates did say to me last night that uh, if there was no second half safety cars, they would have had to stop for more fuel. The 18 car now in, race leader in to pit lane. So we've got uh, two of our three front, four front runners all in the pit lane at the moment. Let's Gage. hope that Shebex can get a hold of Bob, uh, Bob Pearson and uh, Ian Sharon as they're getting out of their cars and co-drivers now into them, get the the driver's condition, if you like. So I hope Tony, Tony can grab them and Rod Salmon as well. He's always got a bit to say. And I'd be interested to hear what uh, Ian's reaction was to that uh, black flag situation earlier. Yeah, maybe not that question, but anyway. <laughs> so I'd see your reaction. Yeah, I'd ask it. What do you think you were doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK, Sharon drops down the order now, as predicted. Beric Linton still yet to pit. Nathan Morgan yet to take their scheduled stop. They're doing pads. pads. Wow. So maybe they're having some issues with having to come back through the field with brakes. Wow, if they're doing that side, they're going to have to do the other side. Brakes are something that we're uh, evenly when, across the axle. We don't see that in uh, one of these races, a 300 kilometre race generally, do we? No, it's a pretty quick old pad change. You wonder why the dealer wants to charge you two hours to do that. In the meantime, we'll go down to Andrew in the pits. Ian Sharon, so far, so good. Yeah, it's, I mean, we had a couple of hiccups there. Black flag, which, you know, like, I don't agree with. I actually called it on the radio. He passed me and then readdressed. And I said, hey, make sure that uh, they know that he's readdressing with me. I'm not passing him. And, you know, we get stung with it. I think uh, powers to be want to put a better balanced performance on us or something, you know. So, you know, the strategy was go out there and go as fast and hard as we can and try and big as, build as big a lead and that kind of stuff, that. And, uh, you know, now we're just going to see how it plays out. Tony, over to you. Thank you very much, Rosie. You've got Bob Pearson with us. Bob, you've just handed the car over to Rick. Uh, everything good? Yeah, everything's uh, perfect, Tony. Uh, we're using the same strategy as we used last night, and um, we're in about the same position we were at this stage of the race, and uh, and Rick's all fine to go to the finish and go flat out. So it took a safety car to get you into the lead yesterday. Are you expecting or hoping that that's going to be the same today? No, no, if it goes as it is now without a safety car, um, we're, we're pretty, pretty good. And uh, while Tony was talking to Bob in the pits, we've had the Morecambe Mostert car in, and Beric Linton comes into the pits, who was our race, race leader, so that will effectively put Jerry Murphy at the head of the queue in the A2 BMW E90 M3. And we're just seeing the left-hand side of this car being attended to. And uh, 
on its way. It was a bit of a, oh, a bit of a something there in the didn't get the uh, the lug off the nut. The the, uh, the would have done it would have come off the drill bit and unfortunately it just cost him a couple of seconds won't really affect him and the salmon car comes back into pit lane in its wake so and it's been garaged so big issues for the bilstein mercedes-benz a45 amg and we see the b1 uh, leader stephen champion come in to hand over to Michael Sharon. That's the father of Ian and Grant Sharon to take that car through to what they hope will be a second class B1 win for the weekend. As we uh, have Tony Shebecki down with Nathan Morkham. Yeah, we certainly do, Daz. Nathan, uh, good stint for you, bud. Uh, definitely was a good stint. Uh, early on, the safety car come out and we definitely don't have the straight line speed like the guys in front of us, so we thought we need to do it on strategy. So we came in early, topped up, got back on the end of the safety car and um, the biggest call was was just to try and get through the traffic as quick as we can and I looked like I was doing it, um, just struggling to get off the corners with the, the focus motor compared to the rest of the boys, which with, uh, with me and Chaz together it was probably the best combo uh, and for us to get this little car up there, it's doing good so far, but we're definitely working our asses off as, as you can see, we're nice and warm. <laughs> Rod Salmon, not the place we want to see the Mercedes parked up. No, look, it was really running well. Uh, you know, we lost power steering at about lap 25, so, you know, that's hard work. These cars without power steering is like driving a concrete truck. Uh, then we've got some electronic problem. The electric problem that we had, same as yesterday, almost at exactly the same time of the lap. It seems to be, once it gets too hot, the electronics uh, decides not to keep working properly. Is that the end of your race? Look, we're just going to go through and reset all the codes. We've got the computers plugged in, because nobody grabs a spanner anymore. There's three computers plugged in, and, you know, they're going to reset, and I think we'll get we'll get back out there, but really just to, uh, to be classified as a finisher now. That lead hasn't changed a lot in, uh, in uh, time gap. It's 26.7 seconds. So it's just come down about uh, eight-tenths of a second in the last two or three laps. So Rick Bates well in control of this at the moment. Doing a good job with that car as it heads its way on to the 63rd lap. One lap shy of two thirds distance in this one. And uh, going the way that it has been for the last five outings. Can it get six in a row? Four race wins at Sydney Motorsport Park and trying to back up and get another two here. Lay in second, Chas Mostert in third at the moment. Class C now, the number 13, Hadra Morale at the wheel. The car sharing with Colin Osborne, the Renault McGann, with some 30 laps left remaining. They've got a, a pretty good battle uh, that they're going to have to contend with, with Tyler Everingham coming through there as well. A little bit further back, about uh, eight seconds further back, but certainly Everingham the faster of the, the two at the moment. Here's Alexander Best in the Best Leisures Industries Corolla and leading Class D, the gap over Troy Rowley in the Toyota 86 is in the neighbourhood of around about... Uh, it's a lap. Yeah, about a lap. So they've really picked up and they've done it twice now. They did it last night in the pit stop and they've done it again today in similar circumstances. Chas Mostert now punching out 122.26. The, uh, he's done the fastest lap in the car at a 121.5 on lap number 49. Rick Bates has done the fastest lap in the car out in front, number 33, and that was on lap 48. It was a 120.58. But the fastest lap of the race has again gone to the number 18 car, which is now two laps off the leader, but it's a 118.33. So not quite on the lap record, 118.15 that Glenn Seaton did back in 2015. That has been a bit of a surprise. We haven't seen anyone better that time. We, we did see Grant Sharon do a 17.4 in qualifying, but uh, haven't been near that time since, despite the, the fact that they've said they've gone flat out all day. Oh, there's no doubt the Sharons have been this, up on the wheel and going flat out. this battle going on for position now, and it's getting pretty antsy between Wayne Cliff and Hadrian Morrell for position. And the Commodore just has a little bit more squirt in a straight line, manages to pull out a bit of a gap. 
but the Renault, a far newer car, newer technology, just seems to be better in some of the other courts. Here we have a replay of uh, the incident between, oh, the, the dice between uh, car 44 and car 13, and they had a bit of a rub coming out of that corner, so it did get a bit antsy. Now, Hadrian Morel's allowed to move one way, and he just continued to move across, but doesn't have an answer to that car in a straight line, but a superior braking package from that car. Now we'll see whether Cliff can fight back on the inside That's coming out of turn number three. Currently Wayne Clift at the wheel here, so we'll see how he can try and stay with this car because Hadrian Morel's not going to give him necessarily all the room he needs to move because he's behind, been behind this car for a number of laps himself, so he'll be certainly keen to keep the uh, number 44 behind him. What it has done is allowed Everingham to get two seconds closer yeah. to his class rival. So this is the battle be too. The both of them could lose out as Wayne Cliff looks to the inside, under brakes, up at turn six. Oh, big slide and through, through. through, runs wide. And that's going to destroy what tyres are left on that Commodore in a very big hurry if he's going to carry on like that. That had a bigger drift in it than the 92 did earlier. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But got asked the question and uh, it was driver skill that kept it on the black stuff there. Driver skill that it didn't uh, cause uh, the other car to go flying off the track as well. Yeah, it would have been like a um, ping pong ball flipper, wouldn't it? It would have just got bang and dispense with and the I, uh, Renault again. And I suspect that the Commodore going into the side of the Renault, what would have come on worse? <laughs> yeah. But exactly. I but I don't think Wayne Cliff's uh, finished with this one yet. He's having another shot as they go down the straight and he'll get him, but Will he have the brake package to go with it? He can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yes. a good battle, this one. Yep. Oh, and they touch again. And it's coming torn the tyre off the Commodore. Oh, well, that's it. Game over. Uh, not not game over, but certainly battle over. It is for the Wine Cliff car hill to come in. The battle's over, but the war may not be. Yes, yeah, well, we'll see. It was getting a little bit spiteful there, so uh, we'll see how that uh, transpires. So it's torn the uh, tyre off the beat on the number 44, so we'll see it definitely coming to the lane. Let's hope they've got a spare left front ready to go. As we see our race leader go through and complete lap number 80. Rick Bates is continuing on his merry way. Looks to have uh, cracked the uh, passenger side mirror to get some fresh air on board there. As uh, he's probably getting pretty warm in the cabin. As we saw, uh, as we heard Mr. Turner say when he jumped out and handed over to Tom Hazelwood. It's pretty warm in there. <laughs> There's no air conditioning in these cars, or none working anyway. And Rod Salmon had to battle away without power steering in his Merc. Yeah, Heaven I, forbid. That's all right if you haven't got power steering. It's a, it's a drama if you do if have you an do, assault and working. it disappears on you, that's for sure. <laughs> it comes yeah, a and don't forget task. you've got that engine and all that all drive uh, underneath it as well. And, uh, yeah, if a car comes with air conditioning, it stops working, it's a beast to try and keep turning. But if you've got a car that didn't come with it, you ask them what the hell is all the fuss about. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Gap, 13.9 seconds. It's all happening in the latter stages of this race. They're all coming together right at the finish line. As we see Alay push the 1M through turn three. Got uh, Andrew Rawls with Barrett Linton. Four laps to go, 10 seconds the difference. Can you do it? I don't think so. I think uh, we're too far behind. Tim's certainly throwing everything at it. He just did his best lap of the race on the last lap, so he's certainly giving it a red-hot crack. Safety car would be nice, now. Safety car would be great, but uh, it'd have to be a quick one so we can have a go at passing on. Class D lead's going to change. Down at turn three, we've seen them running side by side. Class D between James and Alexandra Best, and James takes it away. But uh, she's not finished with and comes back down the inside to turn four, gets it back again. And again, they'll run side by side for that corner. The sporting Toyota against the uh, front wheel drive version, rear wheel drive Toyota versus front wheel drive. And Best gets it back. Certainly does uh, and drives away there as well. So have they used all of what they've got up as the leader comes through now down the inside. They don't want to weigh in on this too much with Rick Bates as Rick has to check up heavily trying to get through on the 86. And the 86 goes through on best to take back the, the Class D lead. And uh, I dare think, hate to think what uh, 
Michael Gray's feeling right at the moment. He must be uh, chewing off whatever fingernails he's got left. And Best will have another go at this. But in the meantime, that gap dropped down to eight seconds uh, because Rick had to check up in the final corner. So it looks like the 86 driving away now from the no. Corolla. Four wheels to the dirt. You want to come on the back of the ripple strip like that, you'll tear up a tyre. And Best has seen that she's had gravel thrown at her from the 86. So for Class D has come alive in the last <laughs> three laps. And uh, of course, Class A too, Jim Polisina and Jerry Murphy have got a mortgage on that. They're running fourth outright. They're only one lap off the leaders. But Rick Bates in this Evo 10 with team owner and leader Bob Pearson. Four race wins at the last round all by himself. Four one-hour races. Did it very, very well. Beric Linton now shares the back straight with Rick Bates. And uh, the last time through, that set a 28, one of 28, six to Tim Lay. So he remains up on the wheel. Never, ever say die, Tim Lay. Because you never know what will happen as Rick Bates trucks up onto the back of uh, one of the Class C cars and in fact is starting to catch Chas Mostert who is now cemented into P3 so that'll be a podium for Nathan Walker and Chas Mostert as the race leader comes storming up onto the back of the Class C second place car goes through and will point up straight here at Queensland Raceway for the last time in the Evo 10, the product car number 33. Bob Pearson started it. Rick Bates cemented the victory. And that is two from two, six from six for the product racing team. And they go into the rest of this year as outright ultimate favourites. They're just driving this car so very, very well. Let's go down to uh, Royalty with Bob Pearson. Bob, uh, congratulations, another convincing win. Yeah, that's terrific. It's great when a plan comes together. What is the key to your success? Uh, you've had such a great year. Well, as I said before, it's all teamwork. Um, everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing and um, it's all running like clockwork. Tim Lay and Berwick Linton get home in position two. Chaz Mostert, Nathan Morecambe into three. Grant Nee and Sharon in four. Jim Policina in five. Six, Dimitri Agosos. Uh, Michael Sharon home in seventh. Eighth is Hadrian Morrell. Tyler Everingham in nine. And rounding out the ten is Justin Anthony. Rick, a great drive, mate. Uh, congratulations. Well done. Yeah, thanks for that. Bob set it up in the first stint. Did well. Came in as planned. We just did one tyre because after yesterday our tyres were reasonable, so we just gambled on one. Um, went out with a reasonable lead, so I just had to manage the lead. I just took it easy to manage it, and then if there was a safety car, we could have pushed a bit harder, but Bob did a good job, the crew did a good job, and um, I just had to bring it home, which was pretty easy. Well, well done to Bob Pearson for his sixth win on the trot in the Australian Production Car Series. The product driver, his rivals, will head to the Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit for the Island Four Hour will form a big part of the penultimate round of the Shannons Nationals this September. You can find out more information about that round at thenationals.com.au. That finishes up here at Queensland Raceway. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to your company from the penultimate round for 2017 at Phillip Island.